it shouldn't be an either or like we'll do a virtual or hybrid piece for those people who can't attend but they might they actually might want to attend in person so we do need to facilitate that as well oh go on just have one you know sort of like waving the bottle of alcohol in front of her face and um and she she felt so bad that she just wanted to leave Welcome everyone to a new episode of the Event Effect. My name is Marijn van Buren, founder of Event Mender and your host to the Event Effect podcast. I'm joined today by Gabby and Johnny, two amazing event professionals. And as you probably know by now, also one or two actually of my well-loved LinkedIn friends. Today we will start off with how they actually got started in the event industry and more specifically, how did they end up in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Gabby, I would love to hear your story. How did you get started? Sure, sure. Um, So I've had what you might call a portfolio career. Uh, So I started off as a professional dance artist, um, which was very much performing, dancing shows, all of that sort of stuff. But um, as I became more entrenched, I guess, in in the world of entertainment and dance, I realized, and and it actually made me uncomfortable, how inaccessible um, and not very inclusive the dance world in particular is. So I decided to go off and and kind of do some study around this. I went and did a master's um, in community dance and really looked at how we could bring dance performance creativity to marginalized communities because dance is very much like, what do you look like? What size are you? What can you do with your body? And actually that's not what dance is. Dance is about self-expression. And the way I got into the events industry was um, I so my career I got injured and my career ended I did I did long it out quite a bit anyway but um and I was thinking what am I going to do for a career I don't I don't know what I'm passionate about and I realized that being a dancer I was always involved with events I was like a supplier as you might say so I'd always be kind of in the backstage I'd be part of the organization process obviously performing rehearsal all that sort of things I thought maybe the events industry might be for me. So I I did like a short diploma course of three months. And then three months after coming out, I got my first job in the events industry, um, working in venues, and then kind of moved into, I I wanted to try a bit of everything, because that's just the way I am. So I ended up doing B2C, B2B events, um, and then sales, business development. And so a real real kind of mix in the events industry. I don't know if I w- you want me to add why how I got into the EDI in the events industry, though, or you can, should I talk about that? <laughs> please, please. I'm very curious. Um, so when I um, when I joined the events industry, I, I did notice some areas of the sector were um, kind of very exclusive or excluding to some people. Um, and I, I was very interested in this. So I ended up joining a, an apprenticeship a diversity apprenticeship committee, which was all about getting diverse people onto events apprenticeship programs and to help them thrive on the apprenticeship programs and then help um, support employers to support their apprentices and then just to diversify the people in the events industry anyway. So I was doing this voluntarily alongside my, my job and I would talk now and then on panels about inclusivity in the events industry. So when I was made redundant during the pandemic, um, and I was kind of seeking, I guess, what I was going to do because there wasn't much to do when we were in lockdown. The racial protests happened and it was really clear the events industry had a lack of knowledge and awareness around the um, the diversity and inclusion issues within the industry. So I made it my mission to change that. I love that mission and i um, really happy to have you on the show here. I think your diverse background um, in that regards and your mission to make the industry more diverse is a perfect match. Um, Johnny, I'm very curious, how is actually how did you get started in the industry? I've been involved with the industry for a very long time, mainly because of my family. Um, my, my father, as many people know, works in the industry with me. We work in the same company. Um, so... Um, it was fate. It was no coincidence that I'm here. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it was through my dad that I got to love um, this industry. Um, but I mean, actually, when I went to uni, I decided to study politics. Um, 
and what the main thing I got out of my degree was to be able to put myself on both sides of the coin, you know, on both sides of an argument, um, say. And in my last year of uni, I took uh, gender studies. Um, so um, I actually did my dissertation on the sex industry in Southeast Asia. And um, back then my, um, my idea was that in a lot of these countries, prostitution should be legalized. Um, but that's a different topic. Um, but it is, it ties into the DEI um, conversation. Uh, Gabby, I'm sure you, you can understand that. Um, so it was in, in 2017, if I'm not wrong, I wrote an article for conference, conference news called The Elephant in the Room, and it was about sexual harassment in that industry. Mm. I think that um, needs free sharing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It was, it, it was sort of like addressing uh, these issues that were taking place at men only events like you know the president's club event um and you know m many many things happened there that weren't supposed to happen so um that's why i uh, i am a feminist so i i i decided to you know just get involved in the conversation and now of course you know that conversation has expanded to cover other things um and accessibility is a big thing for me um it is one of the main uh topics uh i am discussing around the industry and and, and also through the work i'm doing at the eic at the events industry council do you know what's really funny as well we found out johnny and i that um johnny knew to went to university with two of my best friends <laughs> Oh yeah, he was like, "Your friends are so and so and so and so." Like, yeah, they're my best friends. Like, wow, I went to uni with them. That was really random. <laughs> How funny! You're right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, <laughs> good people though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. No, like uh, two completely different background stories, but you both ended up with the the same passion of changing um, what's what could be improved uh, in the event industry, and I think it's a very important mission. Um, both on the diversity and the inclusion um, aspect. So <clears throat> once again, very happy to have you here on the show. Looking forward because one of the key topics we're also um, pointing out is what are the trends you're seeing within, in this case, diversity, equity and inclusion? I think it's very interesting to hear from both of your sides. What would What is the main priority at the moment? Is there already some change happening or do you say like, it's still like nowhere where it should be and this is what's currently going on that might actually change it i'm very curious to hear from your point of view what's the state of the industry and more specifically more specifically dey um gabby can you highlight it from your perspective um i'm actually gonna i'm gonna jump back to something if that's okay in, in that I think hearing about your kind of journey and your past, Johnny, and also mine, it really points out that I think people who do this work, it, it's not just come about because it's fashionable, you know, and we're all talking about it. The people who are really driving this and really care about it, it's been a part of them, their their mission, their values, sorry, for a long time. Um, and I think that's also really important when you select who to kind of like trust, listen to and work with when it comes to EDI. It's not just a theoretical, practical knowledge. Is this something somebody has really cared about truly for, since before it was fashionable, if you see what I mean? So I just felt that was really clear um, from your description. <laughs> so I go back to your question, though. Um, trends, 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 trends. Well, you're going to be able to talk about this a lot better than I will, um, Johnny. I'm sure I'm still on this learning journey as well. Um, but definitely accessibility is a huge one. And I'm not actually going to talk loads about it, but what I am going to say, and just to put a cat among the pigeons, is that I think accessibility is quite um, one that people are quite focused on, not enough by any means, but because it's a very practical way of implementing EDI or an EDI strategy, which can slightly bypass the really important step of really understanding deeply with empathy 
the challenges of underrepresented people, which is what I see event organisations struggle with. So the accessibility piece, which is incredibly important, don't misunderstand me, is a very easy one to start with, which is nothing wrong with that. But I think that's why the top, that's quite a big topic at the moment. So we can add captions, we can have sign language interpreters, we can make sure our technology um, is accessible and, and our venues and our spaces are accessible. But I think some of that deep understanding is it can get bypassed in that kind of mission. Yeah, um, I think you're so right, uh, Gabby. I think accessibility and I think especially because we went through this weird period, you know, where most of us were working from home and a lot of us had to put ourselves in the shoes of people that don't get to travel as much as, you know, all of us do in, in the events industry. And of course, I'm talking about people with disabilities, um, but also people that don't have the means you know, there could be, um, you know, from a um, underrepresented background, um, uh, they could find themselves in poverty to to some extent, and 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 that is also a reason why you know they couldn't be at the event in person. So, yeah, the pandemic really forced everyone to you know reconsider these things, and I think that's the main reason why a, lo a lot of people talk about accessibility um uh these days um also because virtual events hybrid events they have allowed for these underrepresented individuals to have a voice uh in the way the program is created for example because well now we are talking about you know multi language uh, remote interpretation as you said and of course you know using captions um but also you know how long are the sessions uh, you know because uh, you know we, we within this you know there are also parents and you know there are also people that just, just don't have you know um as much time as you know i, I am single and um and and i'm not married i mean i do i do have a partner um so but i i i know that i will have more time uh than others you know to dedicate to you know, my own education uh so forth and so on um so i find it interesting because it is now we suddenly thinking about you know other individuals um there is this this thing we say a lot in the companies it's like oh be kinder than necessary because everyone out there is uh fighting their own battle and I feel I feel like now everyone is living um that um yeah that concept I had an interesting um conversation with somebody it wasn't really about uh, an event necessarily but it's very applicable to events but they were talking about with regards to their workplace they were saying it's so great now we have this flexible working um, and people can choose to work from home and as you said maybe those um, who have childcare um who need to take care of children or need to take care of other relatives or whatever reasons there might be. Um, and, and this person specifically meant somebody with a disability, you know, it means that they've got more opportunity in the, you know, the professional environment. And I kind of said, well, the only challenge here is that we then sort of say, oh, right, it's fine now. They, you know, they can join virtually or they can be online or work from home. So, you know, we're a lot more inclusive. And I'm like, actually, being kind of inclusive and accessible virtually is great, but it also needs to, as much as possible, happen in, you know, the out, in, you know, in person as well. Your office needs to be accessible. The events still need to be accessible. It shouldn't be an either or, like, we'll do a virtual or hybrid piece for those people who can't attend. But they, might, they actually might want to attend in person. So we do need to facilitate that as well, I feel. I think you're right. And I think that's where we've got a long way to go. Uh, making the in-person experience more accessible. Um, because a lot of people still feel discouraged, uh, you know, because um, we, 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 I mean, we suffer from that in London where, you know, the, 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 at the station there's no step-free access, for example. Um, and there hasn't been a lot of improvement, um, you know, in, in, in the past couple of years. So... But in that sense, for that sort of thing, you know, we need to be working with the 
the wider community the you know of course the convention bureaus the venues uh, the local governments um to make sure that i mean change you know actually happens for these individuals i i would say some other um trends that i'm kind of seeing i'm actually um a little plug here, delivering a, a, a session, which is a hackathon at IBTM in Barcelona next week. Um, and we've asked the kind of mice industry to um, vote on their biggest EDI challenge currently. And we know there are many and many things to address, but we thought, let's find out what's really, really the pain point for people at the moment. So we gave like four different options. And one was around um, the talent pipeline. One was around lack of data. Um, when it comes to diversity, lack of accountability, um, which means the difficulty in goal setting and benchmarking, et cetera. And then stakeholder kind of management, how do we work with our clients, our suppliers, all that sort of thing, and, and stakeholder buy-in with regards to leadership. And then the last one, am I going to forget it now? What did I say? Talent development, data, stakeholder, oh, and d &I knowledge. Um, is there still a bit of lack of d &I knowledge and um, not enough tools and resources around best practice? So hopefully we'll get some interesting feedback on what the biggest challenges are, uh, you know, currently for people in the industry as well. I saw your poll, Gabby, and I've already answered. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm also very curious to hear those results, but what I'm, I'm hearing a lot here, and actually I was, I've, I've been talking with quite a few event professionals, and indeed accessibility is something that comes up a lot, but is that coming to a point where it kind of overshadows kind of the the other uh, letters that we're looking at for instance diversity like um i i don't hear it come up that often anymore so i was curious are there any trends going on uh, in that segment um as well gabby um, i think the key thing that we have noticed since kind of the real beginning of the racial inequality piece i'll, I'll start with that is that, you know, everyone was very, very keen to have that visual representation or, you know, someone with a different skin colour or from, a, you know, a different religious background or whatever within their organisations. And very, very quickly people were like, well, there isn't any anyone really in the events industry, who, like, well, not that many people who kind of fit that. We can't, you know, we can't pull people from nowhere and we can't promote people or, or develop people who aren't, who don't exist in the industry yet. So a lot has been working around um, different initiatives to start that journey to make our industry more, um, more, not just more welcoming and more inclusive, but also um, a better understanding of what the uh, well, our sector and the different kind of pieces of our sector does, the benefits of our industry, like the different um, ways that you can move forward or take part in the industry. And um, and I think that that piece was missing. We don't really know what the event industry is. I think it was weddings and parties or maybe festivals. So that definitely that piece. Um, and so looking, putting the building blocks in place to change that really, encourage diversity to move into the industry in a really kind of holistic way rather than kind of that panic of like oh we need to find somebody black to be on our team and you know and it's like it's not really going to work if you look at it from that perspective because if you is your team and your workplace inclusive and the culture inclusive are you ready for somebody from a different background to feel welcome accepted you can't just plonk somebody it's like putting like um i'm gonna give a really bad analogy it's like putting like i'm gonna give a really bad putting a penguin like in like a lion's den or something do you know what i mean that was that sounded a little bit harsh i don't mean it's not that bad but well, it's like forcing I mean, it they're, they're, forcing it's, the it's gonna be difficult yeah. for them to thrive it's the wrong environment yeah. right yeah exactly so you need to create the right environment is what, what i was trying to get at in a really weird way thanks Johnny. no i got what you mean <laughs> <laughs> i i think a lot of the dei conversation especially in the in the in the past couple of years has been heavily focused on diversity and and especially on black representation um and, and this is i i think it's also because of the things that have happened you know george floyd and uh you know the the aftermath of that and how people reacted all around the world and so and uh, diversity, especially for certain communities, has received a fair amount of attention. Th there is still more to do, you know. Um, uh, I, I shared this with you, Gabby, as well, the benchmarking study that the EIC did. Um, and essentially, they, they surveyed 
um, just over a thousand four hundred uh, event professionals in the industry. Um, out of those, uh, sixty-one percent identified as white, um, and uh, from the the respondents, um, black uh, respondents were sixteen percent, um, and I guess what we find is that a lot of these underrepresented groups are not yet in uh, are not yet the decision makers. They're not yet really the people you know pulling the strings. Um, and I guess in 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 a in a in a similar line, when we look at women, right, the, uh, in the industry, we know that you know, there are more women than men in our industry. I mean, I think that's undeniable. Um, also because, you know, from the same survey, you know, 75% of the respondents were female, right? Um, and, you know, six out of 10 of the respondents are in senior management uh, or, you know, board, you know, positions. But when it comes to their DEI experience, they, they said that it was significant, significantly lower, you know, around 20% lower than the male respondents. So even though we have this like, you know, uh, good representation of um, women, you know, in our industry, the experience for them is still very different to uh, their male counterparts. And that's when it makes me realize that they're still a lot of work to do. There is. It's, and it's so interesting as well because when I've been I've been looking um, at and drawing inspiration and ideas for best practice from other industries who are like really starting to get this right, who've been doing this work for a while. Um, and within DEI, women are usually the champions of kind of like DEI and getting things going, getting things off the ground, which can be quite an extra kind of burden in it anyway, in the first instance. But as you're saying, Johnny, as you alluded to, if they're not in the decision making positions anyway it doesn't matter how much they care about because they're, they're you know they're not necessarily making decisions about whether any work or strategies or training or investment is going to go into sort of like DEI strategies and training as well and I'd like to point out that today I think it's today or maybe even yesterday is the day that from now on women are working for free so women are now working for free that's the gender pay gap from today to the rest of the year to the end of the year still still <laughs> That's a, that's a great fact uh, uh, to know, <laughs> not, not a great fact to live. <laughs> it's, it's a shocking, uh, shocking fact. Um, in, in that regard, I hear some very important trends going on. Can you name some examples from your own life in terms of how you're um, addressing this or maybe adding value or trying to change what's going on um, in terms of your day-to-day -day life? Like just some, some real-time examples, Gabby. Can you uh, give us an example? Yeah, well, as I mentioned kind of at the beginning, when I, th I think I was explaining a bit about my background, um, I'm, I'm somebody who likes to, <laughs> likes to have their fingers in a lot of pies, admittedly. So um, I've really enjoyed and thrived actually working with different parts of the sector. So whether that has been with venues, whether that's been with agencies. And I'd say there's three really interesting key kind of, um, I guess, experiences examples that I can give you is um one so I was EDI consultant for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee pageant so that's just a pageant element of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee obviously they had loads of celebrations and things going on and the work that we're doing there for a mass kind of participation event was like looking how we monitor diversity and inclusion um how we bring in partnerships and the community to help create a more inclusive and accessible experience um reviewing their kind of like policies around what was really important for those kind of taking part in whether that's kind of working behind the scenes or performing in the pageant um, and also just like something as simple as we implemented a code of conduct for um, anybody who was working on the project performing in the project but also for those attending the event as well, the expected behaviours of how we treat each other. So everyone knew what those kind of expectations were. And, you know, for um, an event that had 14,000, more than 14,000 participants, it's no, that's no mean feat, but we wanted it to almost be a bit of a um, starting point, benchmark, I guess, an example of how we can start moving in this direction. So that's like kind of a really more of a kind of like larger scale situation. But then I've also worked with venues around 
how they can get kind of more um more diverse clients even to kind of like use their space, book their spaces for events. And we recognize that a lot of that was down to kind of suppliers and supplier initiatives because, you know, if we don't have suppliers who are from different backgrounds who understand um, the different rituals, you know, religions, ways of communicating, the ways of celebrating those from different cultures and backgrounds, if they're not, they don't supply these events, then you're less likely to get diverse kind of communities than using that venue. So we created a whole supplier initiative program around how to support um, SMEs and female owned businesses, business owned by, owned by older people, LGBTQ plus communities, et cetera, giving them the training and development opportunities and even training on how to respond to you know, RFPs and things like that so that they can actually get the opportunities to then get on preferred suppliers list or you know just start working with these great big venues. Um, and then the final one, what's the final one? <laughs> oh, I'm gonna have to look at my notes. <laughs> oh yes, it was with uh, it was with um, at City uh, DNA uh, Alliance Summer School in the summer, um, kind of like with EMCs and convention bureaus looking at what their biggest challenges were with regards to EDI. So just kind of put out a survey again to them and said what are the biggest challenges and then I stood up and spoke to them for 45 minutes on how they could address those challenges um because a lot of it was like around we don't think people care it's not a priority we're not being given resources so I wanted to help them with some objection handling around that so there's a whole education training and actual implementation piece that I've seen happening across the um different kind of sectors and industries and the suppliers within the industry really Sorry, I was going to say, I remember when you uh, mentioned the code of conduct um, at the time you were involved, you know, with the um, with the Jubilee, of course. Yeah, it was the Jubilee because um, I think I think I, I think I messaged you and I said that my partner was also involved in one of the performances. Um, and then I saw that, yeah, that you had released that and I thought, wow, this is um, it's so good. Also, because I mean, it is a template to, you know. Yeah. And Joe was super cool about that. Not that I want to take up loads of time on me, 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 but it was super cool because there was an American tourist who'd seen it up in a tube station. I think St. James's Park tube station. And I was like collecting my um, accreditation for the event. So obviously I could you know, get where I needed to get to. And he came into like the staff office and was like, I've just seen this amazing code of conduct on the wall. Like, this is such a good idea. Like, this is brilliant. And then the staff was like, well, this is the person who created it. And it's really weird how you both just you know in the same place at the same time to like kind of confirm like how important this is to people so I just thought that 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 if you could ever ask for a testimonial about something something like that in real time is like yeah also with an American because you know it will you know shift their mindset somehow you know um or not but you know at least it created an impact making quite some uh some impact there how is it for you Johnny what are your day-to-day -day, uh how does your day-to-day -day look life in regards of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion? Yeah, I mean, a few things to mention because I, I wear a few hats on my day-to-day, -day. <laughs> apart from the one I'm wearing right now. Um, so, you know, for my daily job at ShockLogic, um, we've been working on, you know, how to make our platform more accessible, but also advise our clients how to make, uh, you know, their events generally more accessible. And um, one thing we created uh, was this, it's called the 18F Accessibility Guide. And it's essentially, um, you know, instructions for software developers specifically uh, on how to, uh, you know, make your sites, your and your apps uh you know more accessible for you know individuals with disabilities specifically people that suffer from rsi people that are blind people that are deaf and so it is taking their needs into consideration and just just you know spreading um that education and um, regarding accessibility we we you know i i i got more acquainted with uh, wcag uh, 2.0 uh, standard and that is a standard used today um, for um, you know creating more accessible software 
Um, so um, you need to share yeah. this with me because I've got so many. I lecture on an event management course, and something like that, I'd love to be able to share with the, with the students. Absolutely, also share with like clients and things like that. So, I see. Okay. Sure. There'll be links and stuff like that, but yeah. Yeah, it's actually an online file, so I can send it to you like after Perfect. we after we finish this. Um, so yeah, thanks to the work I've I've been doing with the company, um, and also just to mention that you know one of the things that we recognize, we realize, is that we are a very diverse company, especially when we compare ourselves to you know other people out there, um, you know. Uh, when when you look at you know the male female female you know ratio but also the nationalities but also um you know the general representation um you know it is adding this into our recruitment process making sure that you know we're welcoming people that will add to uh the mix is very important um and that's another thing that we that we have been discussing with uh, other companies um you know the need to you know uh go to certain entities to find diverse candidates um so yeah that's you know around the work i do with shock logic and so glad you said uh, add not fit so glad you said that word you know <laughs> Yes. Tiny difference yeah. makes a difference. <laughs> I, I completely agree. And this is why language is so important. Um, and I, I volunteer with uh, both EventWell and the Events uh, Industry Council. And um, um, so uh, EventWell is a social development enterprise, um, you know, uh, dedica dedicated to uh improving contributing to the to the well-being and mental health you know of all event professionals in our industry and 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 gabby i know gabby has been heavily involved you know in many of the initiatives um and um uh, yeah exactly you know like getting 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 involved where we can um i have to say event well has uh many brilliant things um to, to look at, especially right now, you know, the, the event hubs. So it's, it's, it's a hub that they provide for events. It's a quiet space where, you know, anyone, if you're neurodivergent, for example, if you struggle with, you know, too much interaction, um, uh, if you're autistic, uh, if, you, if you have high levels of anxiety, if you're going through depression and you cannot deal with, you know, the, 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 the um, the social side of our industry, uh, which can be quite uh, consuming and demanding. And then there is a space there for you to sort of like, you know, uh, take, uh, remove yourself from, from all of that and take a minute. And um, I think it's a brilliant in initiative. And, you know, I've, I've been helping Helen to, uh, you know, define, you know, what other events we can bring the hubs to. Um, and um, I also want to mention the Events Industry Council because, um, you know, this is the federation within our industry and, you know, they represent all event professionals all over the world. Um, so, and there, there is an equity task force. So I happen to be part of the Apex Commission. Um, and, uh, you know, through the work, you know, I've been doing with the 18F Accessibility Guide, you know, this is something that we included for a, a more general hybrid and digital events guidebook uh, that we published towards the end of last year. Um, and now they've just released the equity benchmarking study and, you know, some of the numbers I was giving you earlier come from this study and I'm also happy to share that, you know, with you guys. Um, and this is ongoing because the, the plan is to continue working on the equity acceleration plan, as they call it. Um, and, and, you know, continue sort of like, you know, uh, spreading these initiatives and hearing from more corners of the, of, of the industry because, you know, it's, it's, it's never enough, uh, really. Um, the last thing I'm going to mention is that, you know, I am a member of the LGBTQ plus uh, community myself. So um, I always say I'm proudly representing the bisexuals uh, because, you know, we... We don't we don't get a lot of screen time, um, and um, and and I think in that sense 
I have also felt the need to educate my community um, because, do you know, when I came out, it was... It was mainly gay people telling me like, no, 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 you will, uh, you make up your mind eventually. Um, and I realized, wow, how ignorant. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So many people within like different communities, like the education needs to happen within communities, not just about communities, you know, because all, yeah, basically your example there explains why this education is for everyone, yeah. you know. Correct. Yeah. So, you know, just uh, I've, I've joined a few networks, you know, that sort of allow the LGBT community to have these conversations um, as well. Um, and it's a good thing, you know, like w w we all need to improve. Um, it, it's a fact. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. And <clears throat> how amazing that you both do so much like i'm uh, i'm feeling a little bit guilty uh, because i hear there's so much you can do and uh, i think our listeners as well once you hear that two amazing event professionals are pretty much dedicating so much resources to educate others and inspire others and work on um yeah new or drafts that really can improve the the future of the event industry i hope it inspires a lot of us to also jump on that bandwagon and see how we can find a way to uh, really make the industry cohesive in in all ways possible um with that said oh, one more thing so i totally i'll get told off if i don't say this now you did such a good job johnny um also co-founded and launched a scholarship foundation for um people from ethnic, minority and underrepresented backgrounds to get help and support with their living costs if they get accepted on an event management degree course. Because sometimes that is the point why, when um, people drop out. So they get onto the course and, you know, support with tuition and things like that. But then it's, you know, things like living costs that ends up having them drop out. So that's what studies have shown. So we're working with all kind of universities around the UK currently. Um, for this scholarship program to give people opportunities. So it's called Reach Scholarship. Um, we've got a website as well, so um, do check it out. That's what you're doing with Rob and Priya, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So um, our university last year, well, the first lot of students to get their funding this year at MMU wow. has just happened, and we work at the University of Hertfordshire the next year, and then we're going to be announcing our next university, which is nearly confirmed in March. So, you know, we're up until like 2024, four or five now have to wear that out so it's really exciting that we're now going to be supporting people. congratulations yeah absolutely um before we run out because uh, obviously it's a very interesting conversation but time flies i would love to hear a kind of a horror or a funny story that you experienced um within diversity equity and inclusion it can be a personal one it can be a business one it can be a story that you heard from someone would love to hear kind of uh from your perspective gabby can you share yours i think john's is going to be more, like a lot more humorous than mine mine's more of a horror story um i think one that i just really stood out to me was um at cop 26 with regards to accessibility when the israeli minister wasn't able to access either the shuttle bus to get to the venue and then not access the venue either which i just find absolutely amazing i mean you know if we're talking about the UN sustainability goals, that includes, you know, people as well within that. It's not just environment. And, you know, for that sort of huge event on the global stage to make such a massive boo-boo like that, it was very awkward. So it was big crazy. cringe there. Big cringe. Jody, how 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 is yours? Expectations are high. <laughs> so there are two things I'm thinking about immediately. So they're both horror stories because, I mean, I would love to think about, um, you know, good stories. I mean, if, if, if anything comes to mind, I'll say it. But, um, you know, I think you I think you might know her, Gabby, as well. No, I mean, um, yeah. She, yeah. So she, she posted about this uh, much earlier this year about, yeah, it was it was the beginning of the year. And her LinkedIn post, she said how she attended a networking event in our industry. And she is a non-drinker, mm. right? Same as me. So she doesn't drink alcohol, right? And as, as we know, 
you know, alcohol consumption in the UK, um, you know, it's it's um, it's almost like, um, you know, religion. Uh, yeah, it's like a religion. Thank you. Um, so she she was saying how, um, you know, there, there were not a lot of non-alcoholic options. And, and then one of the servers uh, approached her and was like, so how come you're not drinking alcohol? It's like, oh, go on, just have one, you know, sort of like waving the bottle of alcohol in front of her face. And, um, and she, she felt so bad that she just wanted to leave. Um, and I, I've, I've, been used, I've been using this as, as an example, especially in, in, in presentations on how you know the 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 whole conversation about inclusion it, it, this is part of it you know and sometimes just because you know a lot of us live in this you know echo chamber you know where a lot of the opinions that we have are repeated back to us by all of our peers um so this is why it's so important to like you know to 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 be friends with other people um, and now means experience really, because I like drinking alcohol, you know, so, and, and in many ways I, I would be like, oh, you don't want to drink? Um, but it made me think, oh, we, we, we like, there's so much we need to do about this. The worst thing is like, cause I, I'm, I'm a non-drinker as well. I stopped drinking alcohol about four years ago and I've been attending, like, I think when we just come out of the pandemic, I've been to a few awards events. Um, where literally all the welcome drinks were Prosecco, it was all free wine and a few on the table. When I wanted a soft drink, I was asked to pay for it. I'm like, excuse me, you're giving away free alcohol and I have to pay for a tonic water. No, absolutely not. Exactly. Wow. <laughs> so and then I complained about a particular event about that. The next year, it was it was exactly the same. It might have even been worse, the situation. I won't say what event it was, but as I, I'd already given you feedback about it and it wasn't rectified the next time. I think the worst thing mm. is when, you know, something has been set and nothing is done at the next event. Um, I, I mean, I think that's just appalling, especially if, if they received the feedback in the first place, it's kind of like... Hello. Yeah. Talking about being tone deaf, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 The, we just get into this like routine of everything that we've done. We've always done it this way and majority likes it this way. And like when actually we don't even know if the majority like it that way. It's just no one's ever been asked. To move away from that, be a bit more curious and explorative. I, th I think, think you're right. Explorative. If anything, yes. some people that are, that might be trying to quit or might be trying to, uh, you know, lower their alcohol consumption might be feel even more encouraged just because everyone else is doing it. Um, I mean, that's, that, that, <laughs> in a way, that's how I feel half of the time. Um... So, yeah, and we, we, we need to do, and, and this whole thing of peer pressuring people to do something, I mean, it, it's got to stop, you know, uh, yeah. it, it's just not right. Um, the only thing, other thing I was going to mention, I don't know if you guys are watching the developments around the World Cup at the moment, um, but, well, that's a whole horror story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm just horrified at every turn. There's always something else popping up. I'm just like, oh gosh, how are you not thinking about this? You know, how many years ago they were awarded the <laughs> the right yeah. to host, you know? And also because there were so many things that were agreed beforehand that they're now rolling back. Um, True. Like the, the latest one is that all the all the captains, every team captain was meant to wear, you know, a, an inclusivity armba armband here, you know, with like a sort of rainbow mm. flag, you know, kind of thing. And... And they've just said that they're not allowed to or they'll be fined. Yeah, exactly. Which, and actually they said, the footballer said, we don't actually mind being fined. So then they said, no, you'll get a yellow card. So obviously getting a yellow card or getting sent off is going to affect the outcome of the game. So of course they can't really agree to that. So it's a really challenging situation because they were willing to, players were willing to pay the fines, which says a lot it, in the first right. place. But it shouldn't even be in that position, you know. It's just, yeah, I just, I can't bear it, to be honest. Yeah, not watching this year. Yeah. It's it's unheard of that for such a big event with such a broad reach that, uh, yeah, it can be kind of coerced or forced into thinking a specific way or acting a specific way just because uh, of the the host country in that regards. Um, 
really love this conversation. I would love to go even more in here because I feel like there's so much more we can explore, but we're uh, actually running out of time. And uh, before we leave, I would really love to hear from your perspective, from a diversity, equity and inclusion perspective or your personal perspective, what is something you would really like event professionals to know or take by heart right now? Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny, you can start this one. Do you know, Gabby, I think you, you pointed it out for me and it is the way we communicate. Because I think quite often when we talk about, you know, the way we say things, the way we talk about, you know, specific um, uh, situations, about specific people or about adding uh, to our initiatives um, is very important. Um, and I think, uh, I, I do think language um, uh is everything because um, you know the, the the way we communicate may invite or discourage people to be part of the conversation, um, and uh, and that's when you know we really have to think about uh, how are we phrasing this uh, and you know what words are we choosing to communicate about this. Um, so, I mean, that would be my main thing is, um, yeah, you know, what, uh, can we do to communicate better? I, you know, it sort of happens like when, when I say, oh, I really like your, um, I really like your hair, but I, I don't like your top. But the, and the thing is, all I've heard is what you said after but, you know? Um, if I said, oh, I really, I really like your hair, and at the same time, um, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, we could uh, all dress a little bit better for the next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Oh, this vision then of Pose, you know, the TV program Pose and like <laughs> holding up like a different number, like seven, ten. <laughs> <For that. laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> yeah. You are right though. You are right. And you've it's kind of, I'd link to what you said, Johnny, there around language and communication is so important because it, it demonstrates inclusive behaviours um it just demonstrates inclusive behaviour and, and, and understanding around how important this is for, for people and for communities. And I'll take that into one of the most important things that you can do if you're working towards EDI is have an inclusive workplace culture is the fundamental thing. And if you don't understand your people within your organisation, if they don't feel um, included, accepted, um, if they don't feel that they're able to be developed or, or that they're able to contribute in a meaningful way, Anything that you do with regards to EDI is not really going to work. It's going to be very, very surface level, tick boxy. Like, oh, we need to look like we're doing this because our clients are asking this of us or we don't look back in the industry. Um, so I'd say start at home first um, and get that right, get your workplace culture right. And then you can start thinking about how you then invite in more diversity into your organisation, but then also how you make your events more inclusive, inclusive and accessible because you're already modelling that behaviour constantly so then it becomes second nature. It's not like, God, what do we need to do? Oh, we need to do something like this. It's like we model this already. So it automatically goes into our event planning process. Yeah, yeah, I think I think you're right. And, and a, a lot of this has to trickle down from the top, you know. So, um, and, and it helps, as we were saying earlier, when, when I look at, uh, people in positions of power that 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 look like me, um, I will always be more encouraged to go for it if if I see individuals like that. Yeah, who are inspiring and who are, who are helping you as well. Not like our government, where there's loads of diversity and they don't really care about anybody but their their peers, <laughs> essentially. So you, I think you're right. I think it's it's not about meeting quotas, right? I mean, well, I mean. I guess in, to some degree they may be needed. I mean that's, that's that's a whole discussion, but 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 I think I think it's not enough with having an Indian prime minister. It's it, it especially if that person 
is tool representing the 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 interests of um, you know most white people, for example. Such great takeaways, I think. Indeed, the the building the right foundation and in that sense a culture. Uh, in your own company, but also using the right language to actually make sure that people do feel more inclusive is really the first step to making sure you can also execute and put that out there in the world. Because if you don't have the, the example of your own experience, then how are you going to bring or put that word forward? Um, really love those takeaways. And again, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. Um, I know that all our listeners are going to be like, where can I find all this information? Well, I'll list obviously the link to both Gabby and Johnny um, in the comments below or in the description below. Um, so make sure to reach out to them because as you heard, they're doing tons of initiatives on making this world a better place and making the event industry a better place. So if you also want to take that next step, please follow them on the journey. With that said, um, unfortunately, we are already over time, um, but I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. Looking very much forward to maybe having a follow-up on this one in the near future. And for now, I wish everyone, also our listeners, an amazing day. And looking forward to welcoming you to the next episode, which is going to be the last episode of this season for the event effect. We'll obviously see you on a Wednesday. Till then, hope you have a great week. Thank you all.